Welcome to today's episode of the Normalized Surrogacy Podcast by Surrogacy Mentor. I'm your host, Carrie Flamer Powell, experienced gestational surrogate, surrogacy agency founder, and owner of Surrogacy Mentor, where our aim is to help surrogates match with reputable surrogacy agencies for a safe, ethical, and enjoyable surrogacy journey. Today, I'm happy to welcome our special guest, Amira Hazenbush, attorney at law and owner of All Family Legal based in Southern California. Welcome, Amira. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. So I want to give a little bio on Amira, and then we'll jump into our topic today, which is LGBTQ plus family building and surrogacy. And so Amira is an attorney and founder of All Family Legal and has been called a lawyer with heart. Amira has chosen family, representing all ends of the LGBT spectrum, giving her a deeper understanding of the special needs that may be involved for LGBT families. Prior to taking her law practice full-time, Amira spent five and a half years as the Jim Kepner Law and Policy Fellow for the Williams Institute, where she did research and published reports on LGBT law and policy, including discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity, family law issues for transgender parents and children, and the legal needs of people living with HIV. So that's quite an amazing uh, resume there and history working with uh, the LGBTQ plus community. So tell me a little bit about your path to this uh, area of law. Yeah, so it's been both personal and professional for me. Um, when I was in law school, I actually had no desire to be a practicing lawyer. I thought lawyers were just, you know, terrible people. <laughs> I went to law school with a background in public health and I got a master's in public health with my law degree with the plan of doing some sort of public health law and policy work. Um, and I'd always been interested in sort of reproductive rights and reproductive justice in the law. I thought surrogacy was fascinating, but I was like, okay, well, <clears throat> it's kind of a very niche space. You're really working with privileged people who can afford surrogacy. It didn't feel very social justice for me. So it was sort of a, an intellectual interest that I kind of let go to the side for a little while. And then as I went through law school, I did all kinds of public health law work. Um, but my last year of school, I took a class on children of LGBT parents, and I took a class on sex reproduction and the law. And I met my now ex-husband who's transgender. And it all sort of came together and I said, oh, look, I can do this really interesting area of the law and I can work with underserved communities and I guess I want to be a lawyer. So <laughs> my last year of law school, I decided to actually become a practicing lawyer. Um, and that's sort of, you know, how I got from there to here. Love that. Well, I've worked with many lawyers at several law firms over my career, and actually one of the moms I carried for a lesbian couple as a gestational surrogate, and one of the moms that I carried for is an attorney, and she changed my opinion of attorneys in general. She's amazing <laughs> and such a rock star, so I think attorneys are actually pretty cool, mm -hmm. and I've had specifically had a lot of experience working with the family building, family formation, and surrogacy attorneys, and they happen to be, in my book, extra cool, so. I think they're a fun bunch. Yeah, so, they are for sure. Um, so just a funny little anecdote. So when you started your business, I owned an, a surrogacy agency called All Families Surrogacy. And I see this law firm come across All Family Legal. And I'm like, hey, <laughs> that's a little close to my name here. So I checked you out and I was like, okay, she seems cool. She can have a name that's the name of mine. <laughs> so I'll tell you a secret that I don't think I've ever told you. And you might want to edit this out later. But <laughs> Let's hear it. I think we had at the very beginning of putting together our newsletter, I sort of just grabbed names of lots of people who I knew through Facebook and through work and everything. And I think at the very beginning, you were somebody who had opted out of the newsletter and my <laughs> working office manager was like, maybe they don't like our name. <laughs> oh my God. That's so funny. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's because I was getting at that time, like 1500 emails a day or something, yeah, but I'm sure. It oh my God. That's so funny. Well, I like it. So that's great. So let's dig into LGBTQ plus family formation. So we've covered pretty extensively at this point on this podcast, um, the recent Supreme Court. Um, I have to have a big sigh with this, um, the overturning of Roe versus Wade and what that means 
specifically for surrogacy. So I don't know that we're going to touch on that a ton, but something that is kind of near and dear to my heart, um, having myself been an LGBTQ uh, family and having my daughter via sperm donation and also having an ex-wife and um, having to do a lot of extra legal, what I felt at the time were a lot of extra legal hoops to jump through Mm -hmm. to protect my family. So let's kind of dig into um, what you do and what you help LGBTQ plus people do to create their families. And then we'll talk in a little while about protecting their families with this uh, current political climate. But just to create a family, what does that look like from a legal perspective and what types of things do you do? Yeah, so in the surrogacy space, it's very similar for LGBTQ families as for straight couples. Um, What we're doing is we're often looking at drafting an egg donor agreement, drafting a surrogacy agreement, and doing all of the parentage judgment stuff so that you can have a judgment at the end of the day that declares that you as a single parent or both of you as a couple are the legal parents to your child. Now, I'm really lucky because in California, we're agnostic. The law is agnostic as to genetic connection to children, marital status of the parents. It's really about intent to parent, and that's the major focus. But if I have intended parents who are working with a surrogate in another state, we're looking at that other state's laws to think about okay, is a judgment there going to be easier? Is it going to be harder? Are they going to look at whether it's a same-sex couple, whether they're married, whether they're unmarried, all of that kind of stuff. So there's always some jurisdictional analysis that happens at the very beginning, just when in the the matching phase to determine if the state is workable and what's going to be easier and sort of all of those different questions. So I'm glad you brought that up because that was going to be my next point slash question. So to break this down into layman's terms, for our listeners who may not know anything about surrogacy or for sure surrogacy law, I'm just gonna put it very bluntly. There are some states that discriminate and or make it harder for LGBT people to become parents and or to form their families. And what I mean by that is there are a patchwork, right? Of statutes and processes and in some cases laws across the United States and each state has their own that dictate how surrogacy happens legally in that state. And there are some states like California, which are amazing. And as you mentioned, they don't care what your sexual uh, orientation or gender identity is. They just care about intent to parent. And so everyone is equal under the eyes of the the law in that sense there. You go to another state and we don't have to call them all out, but I think people can guess at some of these states, they will say, okay, you can do surrogacy here. However, we're going to make it easy if you're straight and legally married. We're going to make it a little bit harder if you're straight and single. We're going to make it actually quite hard for you if you are gay, whether you're married or not. Mm. And so talk a little bit about what that looks like. Let's say a couple, an L, a, a lesbian couple needs a surrogate and that surrogate lives in let's say, what is it? Texas, Oklahoma, Kentucky, Tennessee, which one do we want to pick? What are some extra hoops that they have to go through in those states that they wouldn't have to go through in California legally? Yeah. So I don't have the procedure memorized for every other state in the country. Of course. Of course. I do it here. And just generalized examples. Generally, right. Generally, it may mean that they're having to do an adoption after the birth. So in California, we can do what's called a pre-birth order. Okay. So we get a judgment from the court before the baby's born that says intended mom and intended mom too are the legal parents, surrogate. And if surrogate's married, surrogate spouse are not the legal parents. Intended parents go on the birth certificate at birth and surrogate does not easy peasy, right? I mean, the hardest thing is getting the hospital not to lose the judgment before the birth. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, not really, but I know what you mean. Yeah. (laughs) So, you know, it's, it's very straightforward. If you've checked all the boxes and follow the law here, you're going to get a judgment without an issue. You don't have to, most of the time, you don't have to go in for a hearing. We just send all the papers to the court and the court reviews everything and signs it, stamps it and sends it back. If you're Sorry, just to clarify again. So in California, you can, two people that are LGBT can be declared the legal parents of their own child at birth or even before birth. For surrogacy, yes. Right. Okay. 
So that's California. So let's compare that to another state. When you say adoption, what are you talking about? Because we're not talking about adoption, but what are, what are you saying? Right. So for some states, they'll say, oh, you don't have a genetic connection or, oh, you're not married or whatever it is. They find a way. Usually they won't specifically say, oh, you're a same sex couple because it's much easier to say, oh, at least one of you doesn't have a genetic connection. So they're not going to necessarily say, oh, we're discriminated against you because you're LGBT, but in function, that's what it is. And so um, what they may say is, well, we can't do a pre-birth order at all. Or if we can, we can only do it for the biological parent, or we only do the judgments after the baby's born, or we're going to treat this as an adoption, even though this is a surrogacy and it's not an adoption. And there is obviously a major difference between adoption and surrogacy, which is the conception is intentional with the idea being that the intended parents are going to be the parents. Um, So it's a different it's a different process altogether, but under the eyes of the law in those states, they may say the only way to really do this is to terminate the parental rights of the surrogate after she gives birth and then have the intended parents adopt the child, which can be a more streamlined process, or it can be something that could involve a home study. I mean, it really just depends on what the state requires. So we're always looking at what the state where the surrogate is giving birth is going to do to determine, is this going to be more time consuming? Is this going to be more expensive? Is this going to be more burdensome on the intended parents? And if so, should we get a judgment from California? If my intended parents live in California, I can get them a judgment in California, regardless of where the surrogate lives. But we're always looking at where is it going to be easiest to do that? And if the surrogate gives birth in a state that is surrogacy and LGBTQ friendly, then We may think about working with a lawyer in the state where the surrogate lives because that may be less expensive. The filing fees in California are expensive. You know, there there are reasons not to want to file here. So people may choose to do it there because Vital Records prefers a judgment from their home state and that's where the baby's going to be born. So we look at all of those things before we go into it so that we have a legal plan of attack before the surrogate even signs her contract. Right. Okay. So I want to go back to what you were saying about the parents needing to adopt their own child after the birth. So I'll just preface this by saying that this podcast has never claimed to be and never will be politically correct. And everything (laughs) I say is my opinion. Um, But um, I have some pretty strong feelings about any parent having to legally adopt their own child. And so for our listeners, if you are a straight married couple, if you're a woman who's married to a man and you need to have a child via surrogacy, how would you feel if the law said, sorry, you're not actually legally automatically considered the legal parents of your child. You, one of you is going to have to adopt this child because in our state, we only recognize gay people as fully parents, legal parents, but you're straight. So you're going to have to go through extra cost expense, you know, time and just the, what I consider indignity of adopting your own child, because we don't recognize your family the same as we would a gay person. So I'm just flipping that narrative. That's what LGBT people do have to do. Right. Um, So I think, what do you, what do you think um, about that? Well, I know the focus of this is really surrogacy, but I think it's really important just if we're bracketing that out to talk about lesbian couples who are having children not through surrogacy as well, because for my same-sex couples who are having a child through sperm donation, which is obviously logistically much simpler than going through a surrogacy process, Mm -hmm. uh, I'm still doing confirmatory adoption for those couples. And that's, you know, in the state of California, it's very streamlined. There's no hearing, there's no home study. It's just a bunch of paperwork, but it is still an extra step that absolutely, absolutely has to be done to legally protect people across all states in the country. So um, yeah, it's frustrating. It's really frustrating that people have to spend that extra expense and jump through those hoops. I think, I think the point that I'm trying to get across, and again, I'm completely biased because my ex-wife had to adopt our daughter because we had our child before um, legal marriage was federally recognized for gay people in the United States. 
And we were told that if we left the state of Oregon where we lived at the time, none of her rights would be recognized if we did not do this second parent adoption. So even though we were both on the birth certificate from birth in Oregon, which was amazing, we still had to go through, I think it was an extra $2,000 and the whole process of my ex-wife adopting our child so that we could have the quote unquote right to claim that this was our child. So I do have a personal, I guess, vendetta against it, but it's important now. And you tell me what your legal opinion is about this. But now we have our Supreme Court as it currently stands. And there's been talk of um, the Supreme Court possibly looking into federal gay marriage. And do you feel like um, LGBTQ families and people need to do extra legal steps at this time to sort of get ahead of the potential that gay marriage could be overturned someday and what those legal protections should be for their families? So the advice that I gave before Dobbs and the advice that I give after Dobbs is the same, which Mm -hmm. is always to do those extra legal steps. So Mm -hmm. need a judgment. I sort of mentioned this before, but there's something in the constitution called the full faith and credit clause. Mm -hmm. And it says judgments from one state have to be legally recognized in every other state in the country. So even if you are married when the child is born, even if you are both on the birth certificate and in surrogacy in 99.9% of the time, you're going to get a judgment, right? That's part of the surrogacy process. You always, always, always need to have a judgment because judgments are what are entitled to full faith and credit and have to be recognized everywhere in the United States. Administrative documents like birth certificates do not have to be recognized. Mm-hmm. And the easiest way to think about an example of that is before Obergefell, before we had marriage equality, somebody could get married in California and fly to Idaho or Alabama or wherever and you know, or move there and say, okay, well, now we want to get a divorce. And the state would say, well, that's a lovely piece of paper that we don't recognize. So Obergefell fixed that for marriage, but it did not fix that for parentage. And so we still need those judgments to legally protect both parents. Right. Yes, I absolutely get that. Um, So your advice has always been and continues to be that whether it's an indignity or an, an inconvenience or not, that we should as a people be getting those extra legal protections in the form of second parent adoptions. Are there anything else? Is there anything else in addition to second parent adoptions that you have your families do? That's the primary one that I really focus on. Um, I'm not an estate planning attorney, and this isn't specific to LGBTQ families, but everybody should really have an estate plan if you have kids. So a lot of those other things are things that straight, gay, Dobbs, no Dobbs, right? Like have life insurance, have an estate plan, like just make sure that you have sort of all your ducks in a row because now you have kids who are going to be relying on you if anything happens to you. So I wanted to ask you about, um, I had read something specific to um, LGBTQ families that there was something that passed the house recently to protect on a federal level Um, the existence of federal gay marriage. And I don't know where that stands or what that looks like, but can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, I very, very briefly read about it. Um, It sounds like it would be the opposite of DOMA, (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. So DOMA back in the day was, you know, marriage, the federal government says that marriage is between one man and one woman. Mm -hmm. And I believe this would be something that it doesn't say that marriage is between one woman and one woman or one man and one man. But I think that uh, it says, you know, we will recognize any any state marriage that is valid. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that that is kind of silly. I don't know. I mean, I think that Windsor already handled that issue. And unless the Supreme Court wants to overturn Obergefell and Windsor, and they were decided on different grounds. And I think, I mean, I can I can get into a whole constitutional law spiel here if you want to. <laughs> it's okay, we don't have to. But basically your advice is the same regardless of whether that would pass or not, right? Like LGBTQ people for the foreseeable future should be going through the extra steps of protecting their family legally um, that um, includes for sure the second parent adoption and in every case, whether the child is born of uh, sperm donation or surrogacy. Um, If you have a judgment of parentage from a surrogacy, that will work. You just need a judgment from a court. 
So mm-hmm. whether it's a surrogacy, a parentage judgment, a pre-birth order is a parentage judgment, a post-birth order is a parentage judgment, a confirmatory mm-hmm. adoption or second parent adoption, those are judgments. As long as you have a judgment from a court, that should be sufficient for every state in the country. Mm-hmm. Um, if you are going to go to another country, if you plan on potentially living abroad in the future, you may want to discuss with a lawyer in that country. Parentage judgments aren't necessarily as universally understood as adoption orders. So mm-hmm. you can in that case, you might say, uh, we want the extra step of the adoption and the parentage judgment just to be extra safe. Mm-hmm. But it really depends on your individual circumstances. My general advice is make sure you have a judgment. And I can't tell you how many people come to my office and say, well, I talked to some other family lawyer who said we're both on the birth certificate and that's not enough or that that, that is enough. Love it that. is enough. So I hope that if anything, if people get anything from this, it's make sure that it's not just that you're on the birth certificate, that you have a physical piece of paper that was signed by a judge that has a stamp on the back of it that says, you know, you are the parents of this child. Right. Um, so while we're on the topic of Oberfell and federal gay marriage and the current Supreme Court situation, um, let's talk about LGBTQ folks who are currently legally married. Um, or going to get married soon, and potentially some fears that they might have that the Supreme Court might overturn the legality of their marriage. What do you say about that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's let's divide it into sort of three groups. So we have the people who are currently married, the people who may want to access marriage at some point in the future, and the people who are considering getting married. So the people who are currently married, uh, the courts have held over and over again that a marriage that was valid at the time it was entered into is valid full stop period. So your marriage should be safe unless you get divorced or something else. But otherwise, in the same, uh, you know, sort of a simple example is um, there was a time when San Francisco was giving out marriage certificates before it was legal in California. And then Prop 8 overturned that and banned same-sex marriage in California. And people were like, well, what happens with those San Francisco marriage certificates? Those were all still valid. They said if it was valid at the time it was entered into, it's a valid marriage moving forward, period. So that piece should be fine. If you are considering on whether or not to get married because you're worried about access to marriage in the future, what I would say is marriage has a ton of legal, financial, and emotional consequences. And so you really want to think through those and not jump into marriage. I am very marriage agnostic. I've been married. I'm not married now. (laughs) You know, I think it's great if it's right and it's not if it's not. And you should make that decision based on your own personal circumstances and not the politics of whether it might be taken away. So I wouldn't recommend that people jump into it without thinking that through. As far as whether there's going to be marriage equality in the future, that's going to be a question that gets to the Supreme Court. I'm sure that it will get to the Supreme Court. I don't have an answer as to whether they will overturn it or not. The, The Dobbs case says repeatedly, we're not talking about marriage. We're not talking about contraception. We're talking about abortion. That's all we're talking about is abortion. This is not supposed to impact those things. But Uh, You know, I've told people many times, if I knew the answer to that, I would be charging so much more than I do, because Mm -hmm. no one can really know what the future will hold on that. And we just have to wait and see. Well, I appreciate that very, um, very nice legal perspective. And I'll just interject my not so nice personal perspective, which is um, let them come try to take it from the LGBT community, because we We have fought harder battles and uh, we'll fight that one too. So let them try. And hopefully the backlash that they have seen with the Dobbs decision on Roe versus Wade and how many people even on the conservative side politically have stood up and said, wait a minute, this is not right. Um, Taking away rights is not what we're here to do. Um, hopefully the backlash has taught the Supreme Court and those who support this Dobbs decision a lesson that um, when you start taking away rights, people's ears are going to start perking up and people are going to start speaking out. So that's my personal opinion as an LGBTQ tribe member. And um, I hope that we don't see that day where we have to fight that battle again. But if we do, We'll show up and we'll do everything we need to do to uh, right that wrong for sure. But in the meantime, I think it's important to just be aware, you know, situational awareness to what the political climate is in America today as it pertains to marriage, parentage, surrogacy, family formation, 
just know all of the things that are happening. Um, you unfortunately do not have the luxury at this time to be an ostrich with your head in the sand and just ignore what's happening because if you're going to be forming a family or creating a, a marriage in this climate as an LGBTQ person specifically, um, you need to pay attention to what's going on and listen to your lawyer when they tell you these are the things you should be doing, right? So I appreciate that insight. Thank you. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about, um, as I mentioned, I've covered this on other podcast episodes, but I do want to get sort of your opinion on where we're at with the Supreme Court's overturning of Roe versus Wade, the, the Dobbs decision, as it's referred to, as it's called, as it is. Um, so where are we, do you think, with that in regards to surrogacy and how has it impacted what you're doing from a legal perspective? Yeah. So if you've already talked about this, I'm sure you've discussed things like can a surrogate access an abortion if she needs to at a certain point in the pregnancy? And that's now going to be a state law question instead of federal law protecting all abortions up until a certain point in the pregnancy. It's now going to become a state by state analysis. So that means in the matching phase, it's now something that you're going to have to think about when deciding where you're comfortable matching. Now, that being said, abortion in surrogacy is extremely rare, right? The goal here is not abortion. The goal is a live and healthy birth, hopefully. Right. Um, so it's a question of what does the law say? How big do you think the risk is? You know, what are you comfortable with? Um, those are things that are going to be, have different answers for different families. And that's perfectly fine. As long as you have the full information and you're making that decision knowingly. I think there are also some questions about frozen embryos and whether those will be impacted by the Dobbs decision. Um, I think in the long term, the logical conclusions of applying personhood to frozen embryos or of applying abortion laws to frozen embryos will be so absurd that it won't stand in the long term. But in the short term, we're living in this legal gray space where people are very scared and they don't know what to do. And lots of fertility clinics are getting you know, trying to get advice on something where there are no answers, mm -hmm. uh, which is really hard. But I think that probably your frozen embryos are fine. And if there is going to be a legal problem, I would think that it is very likely that if you have a lawyer in the state where your embryos are, that they can at least give you a heads up of, oh, the law is changing. This is something you should keep in mind. You may want to ship your embryos somewhere else. Um, but I don't think it's something that at this point in time, anyone needs to be really worrying about where their embryos are stored. Mm -hmm. So I want to clarify what that last topic that you're talking about a little bit for our listeners. So there's been talk of, and maybe even in some states movement toward what we're calling personhood laws, meaning um, there are some people who believe that um, life begins at conception, which when we're talking about IVF and surrogacy, that would be when your embryos are created at the fertility clinic and egg meets sperm and cells start to divide into an, um, uh, well, I think it's called a zygote at that point. I'm not even sure. I'm, I need to go back to my podcast episode <laughs> with my embryologist friend, Sunday Kreider and review, but whatever it is, when it's just a few cells, um, there are people that believe, um, and some lawmakers that believe that uh, that um, that uh, embryo at the fertility clinic should have the same personhood law uh, rights as a human being, that that is a human being. And when we start talking about that in relation to IVF, then we start getting into, okay, if this is a human being and you have a Petri dish full of human beings, can you then freeze those embryos? Because does that embryo give you its permission to freeze it? It's a person now, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and as you said, this is absurd, but this is what some people don't think about when they say life begins at conception. They don't think, okay, if that's the case, then um, what do you do with these embryos that need to be frozen in a fertility clinic? Or what do you do with the embryos that are medically not able to continue onto a pregnancy that are typically become medical, medically discarded? can you medically discard a person without their consent, right? So this is where we get into weirdness. And right. you have a, an electrical outage and you lose 
some embryos is that negligent homicide you know like all of right. these questions yeah right if you and if you as an IVF patient um if you create more embryos than you intended or thought you were going to get like let's say you were amazingly successful and now you have 12 embryos that could viably go on to be a pregnancy well, I don't think that most people doing IVF intend to have 12 children. Mm -hmm. So what are their options if there's a personhood law that says you now have 12 people that you are keeping in a fertility clinic <laughs> and what are you going to legally do with them? Um, I don't think that that's something that people think about when they say, oh, well, I'm pro-life and I believe that we should protect all living things. Um, so it's very interesting now, like you said, it's a very interesting gray area that people are concerned about rightfully so. And so I think that will continue to evolve as we see where these decisions and laws end up. Right. Um, but I do know that there are people who have, who are very concerned who have embryos in clinics in conservative States who are trying to move those embryos to clinics in more um, liberal states, states with laws that will be more um, beneficial for them if personhood becomes a thing. So at this time, your advice to those people is it's not time to freak out just yet. I don't think so. Although mm -hmm. lawyers in that in those states may disagree with me. And obviously you should follow a lawyer who's in your state who has expertise on this because they're going to know the law at the state level better than I am, but just all of those absurdities that we just went through to me say that if this were to actually get litigated, people would realize like this doesn't make sense. And I think that most of the time when people talk about quote unquote conception, they're not imagining IVF. They're not imagining a Petri dish. They're imagining old fashioned penis and vagina sex that's causing conception and therefore an embryo that's inside of a womb and being gestated and growing, not somebody who's frozen in a, in a freezer somewhere. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, all these things that we're talking about just drive home for me. And hopefully I can reiterate this every time I talk to an attorney, I try to say this over and over on this podcast, uh, the importance of working with a qualified, experienced surrogacy slash family formation lawyer in your state or the state where your child's going to be born, because this is not an area of law that is super cut and dry for a lot of people in a lot of states. And if you are thinking that you're going to go into surrogacy specifically, and you can use your best friends, brothers, neighbors, you know, divorce attorney, because they're going to give you a great deal. Um, that's not going to cut it. And you're going to walk into a potential mine, minefield, right? A uh, landmine field of legal loopholes and strange things that you've never even thought of. So what, what do you say to people that um, are maybe looking to cut corners on costs or time um, in terms of the legal side of things? Well, first of all, the legal side of things is generally a very tiny fraction of the overall cost. So mm -hmm. even on the saving side, you're not going to be saving that much. Right. And the risk is so high. If you do this wrong, you know, first of all, legally, it's a, a massive problem. And then cleaning up is going to cost more legally than doing it right the first time. I have people who've come to me at seven months pregnant with no surrogacy contract. And now I have to fix it all. Well, I'm telling you right now, that's going to cost a whole lot more than if they came to me before the surrogate got pregnant. So yes. You know, it's, it's just, it's easier, it's simpler, and you don't risk potentially having to, at least in California, having to do an adoption because you didn't do it correctly in the first place. Right. Oh, my heart just dropped and you said seven months pregnant with no surrogacy contract. Oh, that makes me want to throw up. <laughs> That's so scary. <laughs> like, how, how did you do that? <laughs> oh my God. Thank, you know, thank God. Hopefully nothing went wrong up to that point because that would be a nightmare. Well, I think the point that I'm going to take away from this conversation and hopefully our listeners will as well is that, you know, it's, it's a complicated area of law. There are constantly evolving, changing things that your attorney needs to be an expert in and know and be able to advise you on. But for LGBTQ families specifically and individuals specifically, there are definitely some extra protections and steps you need to take. And you want to work with an attorney who uh, knows what those things are and who at a very basic level is 
educated about LGBTQ family formation, right? Um, but who also can advise you on what those extra steps and protections are so that at the end of the day, when you have your child or children, you can feel secure that you've done everything under the law that you could possibly do to protect your family and make the process of forming your family, whether that's surrogacy or otherwise, um, as legally sound as possible. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I thank you for what you're doing in the community to help uh, people form their families. It's, um, you know, everyone has the right to form their family in the way that they see fit. And I'm just glad that there are legal avenues to do so. And um, I think that that uh, puts a nice head on it. And I thank you so much for sharing your expertise in this field with us today. Yeah. Thank you. So that brings us to the end of this episode of the Normalized Surrogacy Podcast by Surrogacy Mentor. I'm your host, Carrie Flamer-Powell. I want to again thank my special guest, Amira Hazenbush, for joining me for this chat today. Be sure to check us out online at surrogacymentor.com. If you're interested in knowing whether surrogacy might be right for you as a surrogate, take our easy two-minute easy quiz. Take our easy two-minute quiz on our website. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast. Take our easy two-minute quiz on our website. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast to learn more about gestational surrogacy and how to have a safe, ethical, and enjoyable surrogacy journey. Talk to you next time.